of the $27 billion that you have in your budget, only $5 million is being spent on uterine fibroid research. Fibroids are more common among black women. It is three or four times more common. By far the most common benign tumor in reproductive age women. 77% have some fibroid lesion. Why is this not a topic of discussion? If so many women are suffering from it, why aren't we talking about it? Hi, I'm Erica Taylor, director producer of Red Alert, the Fight Against Fibroids documentary film. We started filming Red Alert in 2019 with the intention of providing resources for women who had been diagnosed with uterine fibroid tumors. And my goal was also to bridge the communication gap between doctors and fibroid patients that would translate to the exam room, the operating room, and the emergency room. Since we started filming, we've talked to women worldwide whose lives have been transformed by their uterine fibroid diagnosis. We've also talked to research scientists, physicians, and surgeons who are very passionate about fibroid research and education. Red Alert is more than just a documentary. It's a social, medical, and political movement that I hope and I pray will translate internationally. I'd like to introduce Tracy Chapatel, affectionately known as Lady Shap. She's the founder of the Her Next Chapter organization, the fiscal sponsor for Red Alert, the Fight Against Fibroids documentary. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you to our special guests. And it has been a pleasure working with Red Alert on this special project. And Erica, Erica girl, <laughs> we appreciate you. We appreciate your dedication, your passion, and your voice that represents so many women. Yes, I'm Lady Shap and founder of uh, Her Next Chapter. And Her Next Chapter is a free membership virtual community. And our purpose is to bring important, powerful information and education, like the Fibroids Awareness Program. In addition, our community is a community of women for women, a place where her voice can be heard and be inspired. Her Next Chapter is a growing community and we are focused on bridging that generation gap. So we invite you to join us because as women, we have options and it's important that we know what our options are. Thank you and enjoy the event. I'd like to uh, start off by talking a little bit about why I decided to film Red Alert. I was diagnosed with uterine fibroids in 2008 after I tried to be fitted for an uh, intrauterine device, an IUD, a form of birth control that could help with uh, my period, my heavy periods and bleeding. And um, I sought a second opinion because I was told that, you know, despite uh, the pain that I was having when the doctor tried to fit me for the IUD, that uh, some women just couldn't wear these things. And I just could not settle with that. I knew that there was more to the story. So after getting a second opinion and a transvaginal sonogram, I found out that I had uterine fibroid tumors. I was devastated. I was confused. I wasn't sure what was going on. I thought I had cancer. And so uh, that just sparked 14 years of a fibroid fight. Um, I've had multiple surgeries, one of which landed me in the intensive care unit. And I've been through uh, quite a bit of uh, treatments and seen several doctors. And I was also told to have a hysterectomy when I was in my early 30s. So I know that it's really important to get the expert perspective and continue to fight the idea that hysterectomy is the only option for women who are diagnosed with fibroids. And that is why I've called together panels of experts to speak with uh, our audience, with all of you. And I'd like to begin by introducing them. First, I'd like to introduce Chloe Mondesort. Chloe holds several certifications, including victim assistance and psychological first aid. She's a race health equity expert and a proud member of the Black Maternal Health Federal Policy Collective. And also, she's my Spelman College sister. Welcome, Chloe. Thank you for having me, Erica. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sadia S. Khan. Dr. Khan is an assistant professor of medicine and preventive medicine of Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine. 
Her clinical expertise and research focus is on epidemiology, prevention, and genetics of heart failure with an emphasis on sex-specific risk, fa risk factors such as adverse pregnancy outcomes. Her research studies are supported by grants from one of our event sponsors, the American Heart Association, and she's published over 190 peer-reviewed papers. Welcome, Dr. Khan. Thank you so much for the having me. Next up on our panelist is Dr. Soyini Hawkins. Dr. Hawkins is a board certified minimally invasive gynecologic surgeon in Atlanta, Georgia. She's the owner of Fibroid Pelvic Wellness Center of Georgia, where she performs fibroid treatments daily. She's a graduate of Xavier and Tulane universities and received her medical degree at Morehouse School of Medicine. And interesting, interestingly, Dr. Hawkins is also a fibroid conqueror. She's been extensively trained by leaders in laparoscopic and robotic surgery, restoscopic surgery, and in the management of complex uterine fibroids and endometriosis. And she's committed to helping women live their best lives. Welcome, Soror Hawkins. How are you? <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Soror. Yes. Yeah. And uh, finally on our panel, I'd like to introduce you to Natasha Morris. Natasha will represent our everyday woman who's been diagnosed with fibroids. She's the founder of CEO, she's the founder and CEO of McKinley Davis, a multimedia production company based in Charlotte, North Carolina. She leads a busy life as an entrepreneur in the film and television industry, but life was interrupted when her fibroids spiraled out of control. Natasha will be joining us as a voice of a fibroid survivor, and we are very thankful that she'll be sharing her story with our audience. Welcome, Natasha. Thank you, Erica. Glad to be here. Thank you. I'd like to get the discussion started with Dr. Hawkins. Dr. Hawkins, I'd like you to start us off by giving us a description of what urine fibroids are to our audience in case someone needs a little more explanation. Absolutely. So uterine fibroids are benign growths of the uterus. They can grow from a microscopic cell. So all women that have a uterus and are of reproductive age, making estrogen, progesterone from their ovaries, can produce fibroids. That's why we see it in so many women. And the symptomatology of fibroids really depend on a lot of different factors, where the fibroids are located, how large they are. Not all women that have fibroids even know that they have it and have symptoms. But when they do, the symptoms can be devastating, such as heavy menstrual bleeding and um, pain or even bloating. And some patients suffer from silent symptoms like infertility. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. And also, I want to let our viewers know that we do have some pretty graphic photos that we will be showing uh, during this panel discussion. Um, we do have a, a UFE procedure and also, uh, we want to show you what fibroids look like. It's Fibroids are a bit of a mystery for most women um, because there's not a lot of information out there about them. So we do want to give you a first glance here of, uh, of what a fibroid looks like. So we'll be doing that later on in the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Hawkins, for that explanation. And um, I also want to ask you, you know, we don't know where fibroids come from, but as a surgeon, you know, you've removed, I'm sure, probably thousands of fibroids. Um, what puzzles you the most about fibroids? I'm, I really honestly am always perplexed by sometimes the presentation, even though we know which ones kind of present certain ways. I've seen patients that have had fibroids as large as a watermelon believe it or not. And they didn't even know they were there. <laughs> they came in because they went to go get a tummy tuck and their doctor felt something hard. Um, and I've also had women that have had very small fibroids and um, very complexingly have not been able to carry or hold a pregnancy, which, you know, in and of itself is multifactorial. So there's so much more that can be um, researched and understood about fibroids, the way that it affects certain populations of women um, why some women have it larger or more symptomatic at a younger age. There's so much more to be learned. Um, and that is why, you know, I continuously will be perplexed by what I see and, and how fibroids present to me on a daily basis in my patients. Absolutely. And um, I personally have, you know, firsthand experience with all of that, having gone through, you know, a couple of miscarriages um, due to fibroids and um, infertility issues, uh, you know, all of that. So, and, and unfortunately, it's more of a common story um, than it is, uh, 
you know, far, few and far between. There are so many women who have these types of symptoms that don't talk about it. And, you know, they suffer in silence and that's what we don't want them to do. We want them to be armed with the information um, as much as possible so they can make educated decisions about their treatment. Um, I, thank you. And I'd like to uh, talk, talk with Dr. Khan. Dr. Khan, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'd like to talk about the article that you wrote through the American Heart Association, which is something that got my attention and the reason why I wanted you on this panel. Um, it, it was in the Go Red for Women Journal report entitled, Most People Giving Birth in the U.S. Have Poor Heart Health Prior to Pregnancy. And in your studies, you mentioned that more than half of women 20 to 44 years of age who gave birth in the U.S. in the 2019 had at least one cardiovascular risk factor, including overweight, obesity, hypertension, or diabetes before becoming pregnant. Um, so, you know, of course, the infertility and fertility discussion is huge when we're talking about uterine fibroids, because for a lot of women, it is a challenge, as we, we've mentioned with Dr. Hawkins. Um, and so I, I was interested in this because your study was about the overall health of women um, when it comes to uterine fibroids. And, um, you know, I was recently filming at the University of Michigan, where there is a current study being done with Latina women with these same that talks about these same issues of obesity and hypertension and diabetes when it comes to fibroids. So it is a thing. And so I wanted you to just kind of comment on that of, you know, the, the, the correlation between, um, you know, being pregnant or having fibroids and not being healthy to begin with and how um, that affects our overall health. Thank you for that overview and for having me on the panel. As a preventive cardiologist, this is the focus of most of my clinical practice, trying to identify risk factors before someone has cardiovascular disease, like a heart attack, stroke, or heart failure, so that we can be proactive and intervene. So as you mentioned, the intersection of heart health, so having good heart health or absence of these risk factors, uterine fibroids, and many other conditions like adverse pregnancy outcomes all center around many of the risk factors that we know, overweight or obesity, hypertension or diabetes. Unfortunately, they're becoming more common and also becoming more common at younger ages. And that's one of the issues that we really wanna raise awareness about, particularly because cardiovascular disease continues to be the leading cause of death for women in the United States but most of us, when we're young, think that it's not something that's going to affect us, but it does just in different ways at earlier ages. Absolutely. You know, one of the um, effects of the symptoms of uterine fibroids is anemia. And I know I've struggled with anemia before and anemia, it will just wipe you out. It will wear you out. You won't want to exercise, you know, depending on how severe it is. Um, you can also develop pica, which is eating really random things like, you know, ice all the time, um, or some women even crave things like like clay or dirt or things like that. Um, and so long-term effects of, of that type of anemia, I can't imagine that, you know, it's okay to feel that way long-term. Dr. Khan, can you, can you comment on that? It's a great question. We think a lot about classic risk factors like weight and blood pressure, but anemia is a really important risk factor for heart disease as well. As you mentioned, having low blood counts can make you feel fatigued, tired, but it can also affect your cardiovascular system. Your heart is going to be acting in overdrive a little bit, if you, especially if your blood counts are very low. And if that happens for a prolonged period of time, that can affect your overall heart health. Absolutely. And then when you think of the, the term anemia, um, I'm going to get a little more specific here. Um, I have a, a very good friend who has sickle cell, which is um, pretty high among African Americans. And uh, for, for her to have sickle cell and fibroids, you know, suffering from anemia was, uh, you know, close to deadly for her. So she had to have a hysterectomy, um, kind of an emergency hysterectomy. And so we don't really talk about um, these these other issues, you know, whole body issues that can still that fibroids can affect. It's not just the reproductive system, but it's a whole health thing. Um, you know, Dr. Khan. 
Absolutely, especially for sickle cell, where we know that there are a lot of complications related to the heart, the vasculature, and the co-occurrence with fibroids can make that extremely dangerous. Absolutely. Dr. Hawkins, do you have any uh, comments on that as well? I'm sure you see quite a few patients who probably come to your centers tired. <laughs> Absolutely. One of the um, I would say most consistent finding when patients walk in and I kind of am able to guess that they have some significant anemia is that fatigue. It's in their story. It's in the fact that they feel like they're not able to keep up with their family members and make it to the games on Sunday, I mean, Saturday for their children or enjoy their husbands or be productive at work. And it really a lot of time stems from, yes, the heavy bleeding and indirectly from the anemia and fatigue that wears on their body. Absolutely. And also, uh, I know Dr. Khan, you and I have had discussions about stress being an issue as well, because we think about the stress of being diagnosed with fibroids and dealing with the symptoms can also have an effect on you physically, correct? Absolutely. We know that psychological stressors can influence your overall health as well as your heart health. And so, again, that intersection with fibroids that can amplify the stress can actually have an effect on your weight, your blood pressure, your risk for diabetes. And so it's really important to identify ways to manage the stress, to be able to minimize the stress. And some of that comes with being able to have treatment options, have someone explain to you why you're feeling the way you are, and be able to have reasons for how you're feeling and what the treatment options are. Absolutely. I, I know that, you know, in the height of me dealing with the, the many fibroids that I've had, um, to be specific, over 35, um, I, for some reason, when I, I was stressed out, my period would be heavier. I would feel the symptoms more. So for me, I, I truly believe that it's, 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 it's mental, it's physical, psychological, it all works together. You know, um, So I truly believe that. Um, and speaking of that, I want to talk with Natasha. Natasha uh, and I vibed over our fibroid stories. Mm -hmm. uh, Natasha is a fibroid survivor as well. And so Natasha, I'd like for you to share with us your fibroid story. Um, you're a busy producer like myself who was stopped in your tracks by fibroids. And um, I, I'd like to know, you know, when were you diagnosed and, you know, the ultimate treatment that you were offered? Yeah, I think my, my journey is just as long as yours, <laughs> over 16 years. And I think I stopped counting. Um, just because, you know, uh, it, it gets, it's, it's a bit of a struggle. I would say my first memory is probably 2005 when I went in for an annual and it was pretty standard. And uh, my doctor says, uh, we need to do like an ultrasound because there's something there. And in the meantime, well, before that, I was actually exercising and doing a lot of crunches because I had that little pooch. And then she said, you know, we'll have to do an ultrasound. And then after that, we discovered that it was fibroids. And I said, oh, that's why I couldn't lose the pooch. And she said, yeah, pretty much. And she was very concerned because of the size at the time. So she made it a point to um, include an ultrasound every, every annual exam. And um, part of that journey included visiting an infertility specialist because she wanted to monitor it and also give me options. So it just wasn't a situation where, okay, let's hurry up and do a hysterectomy. Uh, we wanted, we both wanted to be well informed and prepared for whatever decision I made. So went to an infertility specialist and he pretty much wrote in his notes that a hysterectomy was pretty inevitable given the size of the fibroids. And the fact that no matter how much they wanted to try to remove them without um, doing a hysterectomy, it just said it because of the size, it just may be a little complicated and it would result in a hysterectomy. So I did have three procedures. The first one was the UFE. I think that's what it was called a few years ago. I think the name has changed. And then um, that helped just a little. It reduced the bleeding. And the second one was the assess a procedure um, minimal success in that one, although I, I could lay on my stomach without a, a pillow or a towel. And then finally, I decided to get the hysterectomy just because of the age. And I knew that giving birth naturally just wasn't an option, but it's something that I had to work through psychologically 
um, to say, okay, you're hitting the big 5-0 and let, let's just go ahead and do this. And you and I have had discussions about the, the infertility and the fertility and yep. um, how that affects you. You know, it's so many women are offered hysterectomies when they're diagnosed with fibroids. And it's, it's almost like being offered, you know, water at the table at a restaurant at this point. Right. And you're wondering why aren't, why am I not told about all of my options that will still keep me fertile? You know, um, I realize you had a couple of different procedures mm -hmm. and, you know, there's so many women like myself who were, who weren't given those options at all. Um, you know, depending on, you know, what doctor you go to or what stage you're in or old you are, will you know, determine, you know, if they, they offer that to you at all or, uh, what specialize what what that doctor specializes in as far as treatments will determine what they offer to you as well. So um, you know we've talked about how when you are when it gets to the point where you probably may not conceive naturally, um, or if you have to do a procedure um, like IVF, you know there's there's a huge cost involved in that mm -hmm. that we're not talking about that either. But that feeling, if you do want to be a mother, despite what your body's going through, despite what you're told, it doesn't go away easily, does it? It doesn't. It doesn't. And I'm still dealing with that, to be honest with you, and actually had to seek the help of a therapist to work through that because it was manifesting as resentment. Of course, I'm grieving. And just because you get rid of your uterus doesn't mean you get rid of that desire to your point. And she's been great in walking me through it, but I just saw a lot of toxic energy rising in me, the resentment, the bitterness, the envy. And I know that's not healthy. And I just needed somebody, a professional to walk me through this and to help me heal from it because I don't want to stay in that position. I, I spent many years trying to hide those feelings and putting on a brave face and trying to smile through it, you know, particularly going to baby showers. And it just got too much for me. And as much as I want to celebrate, you know, the upcoming birth of a child and listen to all the women sitting around me talking about their, you know, pregnancy issues or stories, not issues, I'm sorry. It was, it would, it was just too much. It was too much for me. And I decided not to attend, respectfully declined many invitations simply because emotionally and psychologically, I just wasn't there. I'm struggling to, you know, try to maintain my self-esteem, try not to look at myself as damaged goods. You know, it was just a lot going on. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for sharing your, being honest with us and sharing your feelings. Um, it's important. You know, I, I almost feel like we need support groups for, absolutely. you know, women who, who deal with these, especially from fibroids. You know, I often say that having fibroids is not a choice. You don't choose to have these tumors. There's nothing that you you eat or something that you do, um, you know, that says, you know, that you do purposely to get fibroids. It's, it's not a choice, you know. And so um, thank you so much for sharing your honesty, being honest with us, uh, Natasha. When you hear stories like Natasha's or what I've been through, um, you want to know that there's people out there fighting on your behalf. You want to know that there's people out there that are trying to make the situation better for you and for others. Um, while you've been suffering in silence for years, while someone's telling you to have a hysterectomy in your 20s and 30s, you know, why, while you know that there's not much funding out there going towards fiber research, you want to know that there's someone in your corner. And that's what I believe about NWHN. And so, Chloe, I'd like for you to talk to us a little bit more about your mission with National Women's Health Network and why you bought, brought fibroids to the agenda um, of NWHN. Yes, thank you for having me. I just wanna make space and acknowledge all the courage that I've witnessed here on the panel uh, thus far. At the network, uh, we help support a grassroots organizations, specifically around reproductive justice, reproductive health, reproductive rights. And so a lot of women who are navigating abortions or terrible, um, inequitable health care, no access. They live in food deserts. They live in places where, you know, they don't have insurance. They're making minimum wage. People that are really marginalized through the health care system, often Black women, women of color, Indigenous women. We're looking to reach those direct service organizations that are supporting and empowering those women on a day-to-day -day and providing them with funding through mini-grants. 
And so I felt like fibroids was really important to bring and introduce to the agenda and the work of the network, of course, because of their um, longstanding history in the movement, but also just seeing how prevalent fibroids really is, particularly for Black women. Um, I'm not just an advocate through the network. Uh, I am also a young Black woman who is experiencing fibroids. I'm also the daughter of a woman who was experienced and survived fibroids, who had three different fibroid removal surgeries and a round of IVF to ultimately, you know, bring me into this world. So when they say that the personal is political and the political is personal, that's something that I bring um, to the work for sure. Thank you so much for that, Chloe. And, you know, I discovered your passion for fibroid research and education through the, the article that you wrote called New Fibroids Policy Must Be Part of the Black Maternal Health Agenda. Um, we know that 70% um, of all women have fibroids, but 80 plus, we're, we're rising now, I think we're at like 85 to 89% of African-American women will have and suffer from fibroid tumors um, by age 50. So we know that, you know, Black women are definitely affected more by uterine fibroids. So when I read your article, you know, the first line it made me pay attention. It would make anyone pay attention. And I just want to share it with everybody here. Her first line of the article says, although fibroids are benign tumors, pervasive atrocities of medical bias and racism have consistently resulted in negative maternal health outcomes for Black women who experience them, including late detections of diagnosis, increased rates of surgery-related mortality, and increased rates of hysterectomies. That was powerful, Chloe. Tell me about when you wrote this article, what was your goal? My goal was to help prevent experiences such as the one that I had with detection of fibroids and ultimately my fibroids diagnosis. I was anemic, I had experienced anemia. I also always had debilitating menstrual cycles from when I first began menstruating at the age of 10. They were always past 14 days, they were always very heavy in flow. And so that sort of suffering was normalized. And I realized that in my immediate circle, whether it was family or friends, unfortunately, that experience was also more common, um, as you shared earlier. And so I actually had a relative who had a fibroids removal, and she noticed the size of the pads and the tampons that I was using and encouraged me to go to my OB and really start this conversation. Um, unfortunately, that experience is also testament to a lot of the disparities, which I referenced in that statement. The fact that we have to be our own advocates and begin those sort of conversations, even with healthcare practitioners who are supposed to be, you know, the experts with these sort of things. And so I began um, getting scanned regularly once I was diagnosed about every three, first every three months. And then we sort of spaced out the um, scans to every six months but for about three years. And ultimately, even though I was going in and getting scanned by a professional, they weren't acknowledging or sharing with me that the fibroids were actually growing. So mm -hmm. at this point, um, I have a large fibroid that is eight by 12 centimeters. And it didn't start there uh, three years ago when I was first diagnosed. Um, unfortunately, birth control was also the only alternative that was presented to me outside of pursuing a surgical removal at that time. But I am now at the place that I am open and have scheduled my removal. Um, I'm going to be undergoing a laparoscopy procedure um, at the beginning of August. And so, you know, prayers, they are more than confident that this is something that needs to be done. But unfortunately, it happened with a lot of resistance, a lot of confusion, and a lot of uh, self-advocacy. Absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing that, Chloe. And I, I was wondering also, what does this year look like um, on the fibroid agenda for you and for um, for your, yourself, your own entrepreneur organization, and also for NWHN? What does that look like um, to be a, a, in fibroid advocacy this year? It's certainly going to look like staying connected with organizations such as the White Dress Project or the Fibroids Foundation. I've cultivated relationships there. We've done some filming for fibroids documentaries, yours included, um, and we're definitely looking to stay connected to these larger organizations that have safe spaces, like you mentioned earlier, such as support groups, 
um, research pilot groups and staying connected to people that are really in the work. I'm also looking to help introduce uh, some fibroids legislation in the Momnibus 2.0 um, that we can be expecting. And so uh, we're very hopeful, you know, that these experiences will ultimately translate into medical solutions, into funded research, education and advocacy um, for, for so many women and birthing people. Absolutely, and I'm glad, glad that you mentioned legislation. Um, one of the key goals of Red Alert, the Fight Against Fibroids documentary is to draw attention to the Stephanie Tubbs Jones Uterine Fibroid Research and Education Act. Um, we're hoping that that is legislation that will get passed, which will pump ultimately $150 million into fibroid research and education. Um, we've got some state senators and some state representatives who are doing individual efforts in their own cities, like for instance, um, Senator Audrey Gibson uh, just uh, passed legislation requiring a database in the state of Florida that would require doctors to put information about their fibroid patients into this database. And we're hoping that something like that would spread nationwide and um, become law for everyone. Um, so we're definitely behind you 100% in any form of legislation to bring awareness to uterine fibroids. Um, I want to also talk about treatments because we've had several of us talk about the treatments that we've had. I personally have had two myomectomies. The first was abdominal. The second one was robotic. Um, the first one was very invasive. They're both invasive surgeries, but the first one I was in intensive care hemorrhaging after my treatment um, for several days. Uh, the second one, I suffered from a hematoma, from a robotic myomectomy, um, and that is not the case for everyone. But um, I did not, I was not aware that there were other treatments available, like many women who are diagnosed. And so I want to talk a little bit more about treatment. So I'm going to turn back to Dr. Hawkins. Um, Dr. Hawkins uses the assessor treatment in her centers, and it's something that a lot of women don't know about, right, Dr. Hawkins? Correct. Correct. It's, um, we're getting there. It's been FDA approved since 2012, and now we have um, hundreds of physicians across the nation that are able to um, actually perform the assessor procedure and offer it to their patients. Of course, you know, there's a lot of politics and a lot of what we do, and there was some resistance initially in getting it cleared and covered by insurance cover carriers. Um, we've gotten it now inside of the practice bulletin, which is one of our leading resources for obstetrics and gynecology as a college. And that has helped. That's helped with the push. So now we have more insurance coverage so we can get it out to the masses. We can get it out to more patients. But it is extremely revolutionary and extremely exciting technology that is a minimally invasive approach. It is still surgery, but it's done laparoscopically in a way that the fibroids are heated up, can shrink. Patients are able to go home the same day, go back to work in a week, take Motrin for their pain, and they're losing less productivity and seeing outstanding results. I myself had a myomectomy and in three months, the results I had from my open myomectomy are very similar to the results that I'm seeing with Assessa for the majority of my patients. And I've done about 170 or so of those procedures now. So it's really exciting to have options. It's not perfect for everyone, but the great thing that, um, you know, occasions like this and education for women is going to provide is that they now know that they have more options than just a hysterectomy or just a myomectomy, which is extremely exciting for fibroid sufferers. Dr. Hawkins, um, thank you for sharing that you too are a fibroid conqueror. And how does that, um, how has your experience with that uh, served you as a surgeon treating women with fibroids? I honestly feel, even though I didn't know it at the time, that um, the work that I do now was, was purposed. It was, um, for me now, ministry. and. For all that I went through with my fibroids almost 12 years ago and feeling like I had no community and there was no white dress, there was no fibroid foundation, there was no IG and social media to turn to, I felt very alone in that process. I felt very alone in exploring my fertility, my relationship, feeling like my husband didn't sign up for this, you know? Um, it is now definitely, I think, very helpful that I can 
compassionately share that experience with my patients and know exactly what they're talking about when they say, I have to walk around with a cardigan girl just in case. I'm like, oh, yes, I remember those cardigan gays. <laughs> so um, I just appreciate it. I think it definitely allows a little bit of breakdown of some of those barriers. Because for so long, many women, especially African-American women historically, um, just have ha built a distrust with the healthcare environment because they haven't been spoken to, believed, they haven't been given options and treated like they deserve to, to, to be, to feel better and, and resolved in this and that their symptoms aren't just, you know, something they have to deal with because they're women. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think Please. that's such a striking comment in terms of having symptoms being discredited, almost feeling like what you're complaining about isn't worth being addressed or you just have to deal with it, toughen up and try to get through it. And the language matters a lot. And the fact that it's called a benign tumor, but it's anything but benign. It's not benign on your health. It's not benign on your well-being. It's not benign in your long-term health. And so I, I think that's really part of what we need to change as we talk about this with our patients and as well as for legislation and medical treatments. Absolutely, Dr. Khan. And I'm glad that you, you mentioned that because I remember Googling fibroids and there was very little information that came up. And, you know, for a lot of women, you know, you go looking for answers and the answers aren't there. Um, it's also because we're still looking for a lot of the answers. And, you know, you hear the word benign and or malignant and you automatically think cancer. So for for fibro for women who are diagnosed with fibroids, when you you say a ter the term benign, you know, it immediately can spark fear. You know, you don't know what these things are. You don't know what they look like. And, you know, it, it's a scary situation. And then someone tells you that your only option is some invasive treatment or to have a hysterectomy where you won't be able to have natural childbirth anymore. And it's just it's 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 disheartening to know that there's so many women, millions of women who are dealing with this. And, you know, one of the things I wanted to do on here was to really familiar familiarize women with um, talking about uterine fibroids um, because we are suffering in silence. And um, we do have a photo of a fibroid. I know there's a lot of women who've never seen what a fibroid looks like. Um, so, so for us to describe it to someone who doesn't have fibroids uh, or has never seen it, it's, it's tough to describe. Um, you know, fibroids have been referred to as monsters because they, they, they look like monsters, um, you know, and, you know, like Dr. Hawkins says, they can vary in size. Um, you know, fibroids can be small and tiny all the way up to the size of a watermelon. Um, you know, one of the women in, in the documentary describes hers as pushing on her chest cavity. Um, they can interrupt organs. Um, you know, they can sit on top of your bladder. Uh, and so they're, they're, they're more than a nuisance. Um, but they, they are very real. And so I wanted to share with our audience a picture of what a fibroid looks like. If you've never seen it, um, it is pretty shocking. Um, so do you brace yourself, but um, take a look. So this is a picture of fibroid tumors post-op. And I'm going to actually refer to Dr. Hawkins. Dr. Hawkins, what are we looking at here? So these tumors, <laughs> benign smooth muscle tumors, um, are fibroids. And I believe to the right of the fibroid is the actual cervix and maybe a portion of the uterus. So even in comparison, you can tell that a normal size uterus is about this big. The fibroids that we're depicting here are about this big. So they're bigger than the size of the uterus, the normal portion of the anatomy that's there. And that is how they can grow. They can be extremely invasive. They can be inside of the cavity like that. They can be on the outside and kind of hanging off and twisting and causing pain. And like you said, pressing on organs like the kidney, you can see how this can continue to grow in height and expansion and cause some really debilitating symptoms for patients. And that measuring tape is just, you know, allowing us to kind of uh, put it all in perspective. And it looks like it's at least about 10 to 11 centimeters. A baby's head is 10 centimeters. A newborn baby's head is 10 centimeters. And there's two of them sitting side by side in this picture. Wow. And women walk around like this just every day, sometimes not knowing that they exist, not knowing what they are. You know, we're just walking around with this inside our bodies. And then someone's telling us that 
these are just a nuisance. They're just benign tumors. You know, they're just, you know, I'll just go have a hysterectomy or, you know, whatever. Um, this is what's keeping us. These, these tumors, which we've got a second picture here, you know, these tumors are what have us doubled over um, once a month. Um, you know, what, what makes us late for work, what makes us not want to wear white, um, you know, what makes us too tired, you know, what, what has us running back and forth to the bathroom during a, flu a movie. Um, this is what they are. This is what they look like. And to know that that exists in such a large number of women, 171 million women plus worldwide have uterine fibroid tumors. So we're, we're walking around with these, with these things. So it's important that we recognize that. Um, Thank you so much to my producers for um, pulling those photos up. And so hopefully that's a bit enlightening for some of our, our audience and our viewers. Um, and we have another question here. Um, one of our, our viewers wants to know, what would the doctors recommend women do who just get dismissed by their doctors and handed an antidepressant or something that isn't really going to solve the problem? Um, I'd actually like to start with Dr. Khan on that. What do you think women should do when... Um, Doctors, when doctors just kind of dismiss them? I think that's a really important question related to fibroids where it can happen very commonly, particularly around that language of this is a benign tumor, but it happens a lot in other settings as well. We've talked a little bit about the maternal health crisis and it can happen commonly during pregnancy, especially among African-American women. So the first thing, unfortunately, is being your own best advocate making sure that you are speaking up for yourself, finding friends, family who can do that for you as well, and if possible, seeing another doctor. Absolutely. And I know what it feels like to be dismissed. Um, you know, I, so my heart goes out to women who do have this experience. Um, Natasha, Chloe, did you want to chime in on that question at all? And that's something that I share with uh, women who are struggling with fibroids and just letting them know that they do have options. Like you can retire or fire your physician if you're not getting the proper support. And I'm very grateful and very blessed to have a, a, a physician, an OBGYN, who held my hand throughout the whole journey. And she didn't force me, but she would just check in. OK, where where are we? What, what do we want to do? and very patient and also very proactive in terms of, hey, instead of, um, not instead of, I'm sorry, in addition to your ultrasound, let's do some MRIs in, in between your, your annual exams. And then she even ordered an HSG um, just to make sure, you know, how these fibroids are growing, how big, and just what's happening in my uterus. So Again, um, I would say definitely be proactive in terms of your your uh, search for an OBGYN and ask. Ask women who've, who've been struggling with fibroids or dealing with fibroids and ask them about their relationship with their physicians. It's very important because you don't want somebody who's just very casual about your situation. This goes beyond physical. This is definitely psychological and emotional, as I mentioned before. And we can't um, underestimate that as well. And we just, it's important to have somebody to walk with you on that journey, in addition to your support team of besties and aunties and, excuse me, maybe cousins or family members, coworkers who have gone through that. That, that support system is key. And I, I can't emphasize it enough. Thank you so much. Chloe, do you have any thoughts on that? I would reiterate uh, maximizing options. You know, this is not something that you settle about. This is, you know, directly related with the trajectory of fertility. If you are interested in having children, and even if not, you know, who wants to suffer? Um, hysterectomies are a option, but they're not the only option. And the same goes to removal procedures. You know, there are less invasive options now that might not have always been as readily available. And fortunately, we have doctors such as those who are on our panel today who are also representative of the populations that are really disproportionately experiencing fibroids that we we have in our corner and, and can turn to now. Absolutely. And um, I, I wanted to mention a conversation I had with a, a fibroid survivor recently. Um, she blessed me with her story as well. And she was telling me that she had seen a gynecologist oncologist 
And I thought it was ironic because there was someone that I, I also saw a, a gynecologist oncologist when I was searching for a uh, OBGYN for my second fibroid surgery. And, you know, as a woman with fibroids, when you hear gynecologist oncologist, you're like, oh, this actually might be great because this is someone who can catch something if it is there because you do have that worry in the back of your mind. You know, things are such a, a mess in that area. Could, could there be cancer? You know, I've had this for so long. Is there something that was missed? And so she had had that experience of uh, going to a gynecologist oncologist and being dismissed. Once he told her that a hysterectomy was her only option, uh, she said, I don't want a hysterectomy. And he pretty much dismissed her. I had that exact same experience, not the same doctor, but same type of doctor. And I had that same experience. So I know what that feels like. And it, it's just it's really disheartening and, and it hurts. It's painful to feel dismissed when someone um, doesn't feel like they've prioritized the many years of pain that you've endured. So it's very important to take that uh, situation into your own hands and seek out a physician who you feel is best suited for you and the options that uh, you wanna be offered for your fibroid treatment. All right. Well, ladies, this has been a remarkable discussion. Um, I do want to start to wrap up our conversation, but if there's any questions any of you have, we've got doctors here that can answer questions for you. Um, I definitely want to open that up if you have any concerns um, or any comments that you'd like to add. How about a closing comment from each one of you? I would like to introduce that. I'll start with Dr. Hawkins. Um, I think Dr. Khan said it best advocate for yourself. Be your best patient advocate. Speak up. Get your point across when you go and see your doctors. And if it's not working for you, get a second opinion. I mean, on average, women are waiting and having to go through 3.6 years of not knowing what's going on with their body when they start to have symptomatology. And 40% of fibroid sufferers see even three doctors before they get diagnosed. A part of the problem in getting that earlier diagnosis and really getting options to you that could be minimally invasive before you have to be given limited options is that dismissal. So be your best advocate, speak up for yourself and seek out even a specialist if needed. Um, I'm a minimally invasive gynecological surgeon. This is specifically what I do. And there's a good a bit of us, not enough of us, but a few of us. So seek out a specialist if necessary to get your point across and get your treatment. Thank you so much. Chloe? I would say get connected. Um, get connected with people who are in the space, whether they're your local advocates, whether they are members of support groups, such as with, again, the Fibroids Foundation or the White Dress Project. Reach out to organizations such as the network or your local smaller reproductive justice organization um, and see what resources are there. Um, you don't have to navigate it alone, whether or not you personally know um, people in your family or in your friend group that have fibroids. Um, there are so many more networks to tap into now, and I definitely encourage anyone who is experiencing symptoms to explore them. Thank you so much. Dr. Khan, um, any parting words? I echo all the sentiments that we've heard already, and really want to emphasize, prioritize yourself, prioritize your health, both in the fight against fibroids, but also your long-term heart health. They're both connected and making sure that you have your eye on the long game in terms of um, not only focusing on your physical health, but also your mental health. Absolutely. And last but not least, Natasha. Yes, uh, ditto. <laughs> on all three <laughs> comments and just really suggesting to those women who are struggling right now to speak out and speak up. Um, that's what I did. And I found out um, there were four women that were ha managing or handling their with five, excuse me, struggling with fibroids. And we kind of created this, this support system, even though we weren't friends, we were uh, primarily coworkers and our, our attitude toward each other was, was um, you too. So that just kind of did a little woo moment for us and realizing that we weren't alone. So just piggybacking off of what Chloe said in terms of seeking out resources, 
just be mindful of seeking out other women. Um, not to say you have to put your information or your you know, on on um, on blast, if you will. But you never know who's suffering with you. You never know who's dealing with the same situation. And that's just really been my experience. And just speaking up and speaking out and finding out, oh, you too, and just bonding closer with each other. So that support group um, is very important throughout the entire journey as you're considering your surgeries and even your recovery and thereafter. So. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And, and I had no shortage of women uh, when I was looking for people for Red Alert to fight against fibroids. I mean, right next door, right around the corner in your friend circle, there's someone who has been diagnosed or has yet to be diagnosed, unfortunately. So thank you so much. And thank you so much to all of our panelists. You all have been a wealth of information. Um, I personally feel blessed by all the information you've presented. I know our, our viewers, our audience are you know eager to learn more. Um, there are many things to learn about fibroids, and we are still um, right on the brink of that information. Um, I'd like for you all to know that you can keep in contact with everyone that's on this panel. They're all doing amazing things. Um, feel free to reach out. Let them know that you saw them here at um, Red Alert, a conversation about her health. Thank you again to all of our panelists for blessing us with so much information. And remember that fibroid patients are they're more than patient numbers. They are real people, real women who've been diagnosed, who deal with these things every single day, and they have a face. Fibroid patients have a face. And with that said, here are a few faces of fibroids. I am Shona, and I am the face of fibroids. I am Lisa, and I am the face of fibroids. I'm Karen, and I'm a fibroid survivor. My name is Felicia, and I am the face of fibroids. I am Ludmila, and I am the face of fibroids. I am Dia Direct, and I am a fibroid survivor. This has been so exciting thus far. Our reproductive medical health panel was amazing, and um, we are happy to continue the party, to keep it going, to um, educate as many women as we can about uterine fibroids. I'd like to take a moment to um, talk about Red Alert. Um, we started filming Red Alert in 2019. We've been to, oh gosh, I, I've lost count of how many cities we've been to for Red Alert, but we've talked to research scientists. We have the support of National Institute of Health and the National Institute of Child Health Development. Um, we've talked to scientists at various universities, including Northwestern University, uh, University of Chicago, and we are still filming Red Alert, the Fight Against Fibroids. We want to give you as much information as we can, up-to-date information, um, so you can make educated decisions about your health and also know that you're not alone. But in order to do so, um, we have to continue with our film finishing fund. We are still raising monies to um, to finish our production and uh, you too can donate and be a part of our crew. Um, there's a QR code on your screen. You can pull out your phone at this very moment. Um, no amount is too small. We are very thankful for everything uh, that you give. And we look forward to being able to present the most insightful documentary um, and help women worldwide who are suffering from uterine fibroids. early on and so we definitely want to re-examine how early we're talking to girls about uh, reproductive health and what can go wrong not just talk to them about their sexual health and what can go wrong there but we want to also talk about what can go wrong with your cycle and the things that you need to look out for at an early age after becoming vegan i realized that my symptoms of um, my period were starting to get better and for me it was mainly um, it was getting lighter and the cramps weren't as intense. All right, 
it's time for us to get started with our next panel of guests. This is our holistic healing health and wellness panel. I'm really excited about this panel and understanding health and wellness, holistic healing, and how our environment can alter how our bodies process anything is something that I took really great interest in when I was producing my first film, The Invisible Vegan, which is out on Amazon Prime. And now as a fibroid fighter, I'm even more tuned in. Um, I became vegan about six or seven years ago. And once I learned the effects of red meat with fibroid symptoms, I changed my diet and it changed my life. Um, I was actually given a 0.1% chance of naturally conceiving. And um, I'd never been pregnant before. And I decided to uh, try veganism just because I wanted to live a healthier life every day. I didn't want my fibroid symptoms to just completely take over my life every month. So I changed my diet and became vegan. And despite giving that 0.1% chance of conceiving, I did conceive two months after going vegan. So that was pretty interesting to me. And so I'm, I'm definitely um, an advocate for healthy eating and what it can do to your body overall. So with that said, I'd like to introduce our next panel of guests. Our first panelist I'd like to introduce is Annette Presley. Annette Presley is a registered and licensed dietitian, a certified functional nutritionist, root cause protocols cons root cause protocol consultant, a certified theta healer, women's health nutrition specialist, author, and speaker. Annette's the creator of the Revive Method, and after discovering that the diet advice she learned as a dietitian was contributing to chronic disease, Annette changed course to learn about functional nutrition and nutrigenomics which is how nutrition impacts genetic expression. Welcome, Annette. Thank you so much for having me. This is such a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Next on our panel is Dr. Olabuyeni Abraham. She's the founder of Triggered Pelvic Therapy in da Dallas, Texas. She's affectionately known as Dr. Yeni. She's a forward-thinking physical therapist who made it her business to address fertility concerns, pelvic pain, and pregnancy-related conditions in women. Uh, she uses gynovisceral manipulation techniques to treat and manage female mechanical infertility. Her work addresses issues of the ovaries, hormone issues, and other reproductive diagnoses like uterine fibroids. She's a first-generation Nigerian, and Dr. Yeni is passionate about mentoring young women and providing expert care. Welcome, Dr. Yeni. Thank you. <laughs> and next, we have Chef Aki Taylor. Chef Aki is CEO of Delicious Indigenous, and she's a celebrity chef, author, and natural foods, foods advocate. She's reinvented the green movement in just five years and promotes a holistic healing approach to diet and nutrition for the mind, body, and soul. Chef Aki understands her Choctaw and Cherokee Indian roots and embraces the earth as a source of electric foods. She spreads the message of wellness through a plant-based diet and professionally has a client base that includes rappers and stars like Waka Flocka and Lenny Kravitz, just to name a few. She's authored several cookbooks, including the Fibroid Elimination Recipe Guide. And if you haven't heard her TEDx talk, you definitely want to check it out. Chef Aki is blessing us all the way from Belize today. Welcome, Chef Aki. Thanks for having me. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us. It is certainly a pleasure to have you in our panel discussion today. And I'd like to start the conversation off with Dr. Yenny. I was really... Um, I want to say impressed and excited once I learned about triggered uh, pelvic therapy. Um, it's something that I was really close to because as I, I mentioned to our viewers earlier, um, I was given a 0.1% chance of, of conceiving. And although my pregnancy didn't come to term, um, one of the things that I was doing once I went vegan was also something called the Mayan fertility massage that I found out about on YouTube. And so I started doing this, this massage on myself and I really feel like that massage helped with uh, the pregnancy that did occur. Um, and so I'm, I'm definitely all on board with what it is that you offer through triggered 
physical therapy. Um, and, and you could have chosen to go into a number of spaces to heal. I mean, you're a physical therapist, so you could be helping people get over car accidents and, and anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. Do physical therapy to help women with infertility, bladder leakage, and reproductive health issues. Why? You know, I think I always say, I think that um, my specialty kind of found me. I didn't go out looking after it. Um, I've always been the women's health girl, even when I was in pelvic and physical therapy school, everyone knew me as the girl who loved pelvic floor. And so naturally, even after graduation, when you are in pelvic health and you're really passionate about uh, women, you start to treat them and you start to see kind of a consistent issue. And for me, I just happened to happen to have so many women who had reproductive challenges. And it always came in the form of either endometriosis or uterine fibroids. And um, some of these women were a majority women of color, black women. And so I'm like, you know what, um, whatever it is that I, I can do to serve this population, I think that I have this skill set or I can go and get the continuing education to better serve this community. And so that's pretty much what I did is I just started, I really started um, leaning on a lot of the skills from our European friends, you know, doing some work with the Baral Institute and learning some of their techniques and bringing that here in the States where some of the techniques are not necessarily popular and seeing so many great results. So I would have patients who had failed IVF cycles, who had a lot of challenges, you know, with um, having a child to term, having recurrent miscarriages and losses. And, you know, we were able to decrease adhesions, um, increase blood flow into the uterine cavity and be able to successfully help them um, through some of the challenges they were having. So it's been a really interesting um, journey for me personally. And I think, you know, when I hear the Mayan massage, I'll just say that the biggest difference is what I do is just Western medicine and Mayan massage is an ancestral um, form, a technique that is passed down generationally. Um, and so, yeah, it's just, it's really amazing the work that we do. Absolutely. And when women come to your practice, how are they typically feeling and, and what kind of, uh, what are the common questions that they ask? I will say the number one thing people see me for is chronic pain. Um, I think that's really my main specialty right now is chronic pelvic pain. And sometimes that manifests in the form of prolonged psych periods, prolonged menses, having fibroids, that's a really common thing, or um, pain with ovulation or pain um, with exercise. Sometimes people have pain with intercourse. And so pain is the number one reason why people end up in my office. And then sometimes they're like, oh yeah, I have pain and I'm struggling to conceive, or I have pain and I have all these fibroids that keep reoccurring even after having myomect a history of having myomectomies. Okay, so when a woman comes into your office, what is it that they can expect um, from a pelvic therapist? Well, I, I always say I'm not your typical pelvic floor therapist. I'll say that um, because a lot of pelvic floor therapists are super orthopedic, but I care about the organs. I care about um, I care about just the way that your body is connected. I care about what you eat. I care about how you sleep, your lifestyle pattern. I feel like all those things are contribute to your overall wellness. And so my evaluations are pretty thorough. They're 75 minutes, which is longer than most people spend in front of a doctor. And so I think people are typically surprised and excited when they hear they get to spend that much time just going through what's going on. We do um, we do our subjective, which is we work through our, their history, but we actually get to finally do a physical examination. And actually I can, and my hope is to reproduce the pain they're experiencing outside of the office so that I can kind of give some context to what is going on. So I really hope to encourage and give some level of clarity because a lot of times women who are struggling with pain or conception or fibroids are constantly like, I don't know why, you know, um, or they're constantly given the reason of your hormones are out of whack or your labs are abnormal, but they can feel this physical manifestation going on that feels like, I feel like if I could just release this muscle or if I feel like if I just had better blood flow, I would feel better in a hundred, you know, most times they're correct. So, because we are very intuitive as women and we can kind of figure out you know, naturally, like, this is the direction I feel like this is, you know, where my pain is coming from. And so it's really, it's really great to work hand in hand. And, you know, some people, they get relief as quickly as, you know, just in a handful of sessions. Some patients, I've been seeing them for two years. Um, and that's just because we're managing and our goals are changing. Once we get them out of pain, now we get to focus on making sure their cycles are regular. And then now we get to focus on the fact that we're making a baby. And those are those are the really exciting patients when you get to kind of walk them through these different phases of life. 
Well, that is amazing. And something that I know a lot of people don't know exists. I think exactly. what you have is really rare and um, a blessing to many women, I'm sure. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> and speaking of the overall health, um, Chef Aki, thank you so much for blessing us all the way from Belize today. Uh, you are a not just a, just a celebrity chef, like that's enough in itself, but you're also an author and an ND nutritional counselor. Um, and you also have this amazing fibroid elimination guide. But I, 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 I want to know, you've dedicated your talent to, to the healing foods and talking about the healing foods that exist. Why? Why, why do that? Oh, that's a really great question. You know, I didn't come into the culinary world, I, I guess, in the, the conventional way. My goal was never to just create meals to satiate your taste buds. Uh, but my motto was always, I cook to cure. And um, I was, I kind of came into the culinary world under the guidance of people like Aris Latham, Queen of Food, uh, Jewel Pukram, and, and uh, Dr. Sabi, uh, people who were using herbs and foods and lifestyle to cure. But I understood that, you know, as a woman from the South, I love those rich and soulful and super flavorful foods. So I was clear that I needed to learn how to make these foods taste really good for my clients in mm -hmm. order to heal them. Absolutely. And, and I'm glad you mentioned all those other names, because as I've been researching, um, you know, healthy li living and healthy eating um, on the fibroid journey, Dr. Sabi's name has come up. Queen of Fila's name has come up. Um, these are folks who have dedicated their time and their energy to showing women how to uh, heal themselves from the inside out naturally. Um, there's so many, so many things that were affected by, and we'll definitely get into that um, with Miss Annette Presley in just a second. Um, but you know, there's so many things in our everyday life that we're affected by that we don't realize is, is affecting our reproductive health, our overall health. Um, you know, you may get a, a stuffy nose, or you may get, you know, the pelvic pain, and you're not sure what's going on. It may be something that you may not even realize is completely. Um, you know, uh, uh, something dealing with your environment um, or something that you ate that could be uh, affecting this long term even. So it's really important that we know we have this information so we can heal thyself. Uh, Absolutely. Well. That's the core of holistic health. You know, everything yeah. is connected. Um, you know, people come to me all the time and say, hey, what can I take for this or that? Hmm. And I'm thinking, you know, that's a Western approach to the sure. whole person. Mm -hmm. uh, we got to first go and address every part of you. So if I go and tell you, oh, just eat mangoes, you know, mm -hmm. then we're, we're not going to really address maybe the detoxification that needs to happen for your liver and your kidneys. Maybe you've been eating okay, but you've been drinking really bad. Maybe you've been smoking, so your lungs are causing issues in other areas. Mm -hmm. so every, the whole body's connected, and that really is the charge of any a uh, holistic practitioner is to address the whole person, mind, body, and spirit. So that's always been my position. Food for me was just kind of a, a nice way in, you know, um, and everyone loves to eat. So, you know, I, I really figured if I could make some beautiful meals, uh, starting with a fibroid elimination recipe guide, which actually worked in tandem with something called the fibroid elimination Bible, Mm. Uh, created by two uh, herbalists and endocrinologists uh, out of London that I worked with very closely for like 15 years. Um, started the fiber elimination Bible and we just added the recipe component so that people could know once they got home, well, what do I eat and how do I start a plant-based diet to shrink these fibroids? Yes, absolutely. I love it. And that you had actually answered a, a question I was about to ask you about uh, your take on how the mind, body, and soul work together. I know on your website I saw something that said the outside matches the inside home. So, mm -hmm. so uh, what is your take on that, the, 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 the connection between the mind, body, and soul? Mm -hmm. So this is really important. You know, um, my position is that we are all first, spirit first. Everything is spirit first. Uh, spirit is what emanates, you know, the rest of the physical body, that this is just our life jacket here. And that um, whatever we think is what we're creating, um, that is at the core of any you know, holistic naturopathic theology is that what the, where the mind goes, the body follows. 
So we have to first address sometimes um, wound pain, you know, uh, mm -hmm. issues, baggage that we hold about our reproductive, you know, system, uh, issues that maybe we had with our mothers, our grandmothers, mm -hmm. uh, things that we were taught about whether or not our sexuality and sensuality is nasty or it's bad or it's wrong. All of these things that have to do with our womb health, our breast health, our body image. Uh, oftentimes it's just a lot of mental baggage that we're carrying and that mental baggage manifests physically because we'll start to eat things based on our emotions. So if I feel a lack of um, comfort in my body, then I may start to uh, 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 do things like <clears throat> um, eat, eat, eat things that don't serve me on a regular basis. I may start to binge eat. I may start to not eat enough. I may start to make myself throw up and I, you know, I have you know, anemia issues. There's so many things that come from the mind and the spirit first. And the womb for women really is the seed of all of our creation. So if we're going to create anything, the womb wants to create, that's its job is just to multiply what we give it. So if I'm giving it negative thoughts, if I'm giving it uh, bad foods, I'm giving it chicken wings and pizza every night and dairy, then oftentimes instead of producing, you know, if, if I'm not producing children, I will create maybe a tumor. So the connection is, is just an inevitable, the connection there. That is some truth right there. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I have more questions for you, uh, Chef Aki, because uh, you did say a buzzword, and I'm going to come back to that buzzword in just a moment. Um, I'd like to turn our attention to Annette Presley. Um, Annette and I first connected through an acquaintance who knew that I was having fertility issues. And Annette was a, a wealth of information. Um, Annette, you're, you're known for helping women who are frustrated with their bodies find peace by understanding how. Um, you know, I, I would definitely want to talk more about um, what does it mean that our biology is mis mismatched with our environment? Yeah, so we live in a world now that is very different from the world our ancestors grew up in. And we have toxins in our food, there's toxins in our environment. Um, there's toxins in our body now, um, there, you know, and we can't avoid all these things. Um, the problem is that our genes haven't really caught up. And so some of us have trouble getting rid of these toxins. And um, this is where people would have, I call them a gene glitch. So the glitch is um, they just have a much harder time eliminating toxins than other people. And this explains why some people have a harder time getting pregnant um, and it could show up in other areas too. So it could be heart disease, cancer, diabetes. Um, all of these things are affected by our environment and our genes. And, and um, our thoughts too are incredibly important because they can be toxic thoughts or they can be healing thoughts. Um, and so it just kind of comes from all around and, and we actually can change um, the way our genes express so that we can express for health instead of disease. Um, just by changing our thinking and changing the things that we expose ourselves to in the environment and the types of food we eat. Absolutely. And um, one of the discussions that you and I had, Annette, um, that you turned me on to was iodine testing. Yes. Can you explain to us why it's important for us to know what our iodine levels are? Yes, I think iodine testing should be the number one thing we do for women's health uh, because nearly everything a woman suffers from has an iodine deficiency component. And that's all the way from like fibroids, breast cancer, um, even cancers of the uterus, uh, cervix. Um, you've got uh, fibrocystic breast disease, endometriosis, anxiety, depression, um, and that's, and I think that's why we have a lot of those symptoms together. You know, it's usually it's not just one thing, um, but iodine affects all of those things. And we don't get enough iodine in our diet anymore. And um, one of the interesting things, you know, African-American women do have a harder time um, because a lot of them are lactose intolerant and dairy is one of the food sources of iodine in the diet. 
Um, and so, you know, for, and a lot of people don't eat seaweed anymore, um, but then we've got the issue of our oceans are polluted and there's a lot of um, toxins like bromide, uh, chlorine and fluoride all interfere with iodine absorption in the body. And bromide is in everything. And it's, our seaweed is contaminated with it. It's in carpet, furniture, cars, uh, computers. So like we're all being exposed right now because <laughs> we're in front of our computers. Um, it, I mean, it's, it's literally in everything. Uh, fire retardant clothing. And if you think about the children growing up in pajamas with fire retardants on them, um, fire retardant mattresses, all of those things. And then you've got swimming pools, you've got chlorine in the water that you're showering in, uh, fluorides in our toothpaste, it's in our water, it's everywhere. If you're a tea drinker, you're probably getting a lot of fluoride. Uh, and so we just, we have all of these things coming in and we're just not re getting enough of the iodine to displace those. And we actually talk about that in um, the Red Alert, the Fight Against Fibroids documentary with a representative for the National Women's Health Network about how uh, everyday chemicals um, and, and chemicals that we use in our hair, especially black women, um, there are chemicals that we use um, to straighten our hair or to groom our hair that are very harmful to our reproductive health. So it's really important to understand how all of these things contribute to these diagnoses that we have, including uterine fibroids. So, um, you know, very, very useful information. Um, and uh, what would you say, Annette, to people who say, oh, you know, all this stuff exists, but, you know, my immune system, I've got a good immune system that can handle it. What would you say to that? Yeah, um, your immune system is going to die out eventually <laughs> if you keep feeding yourself crap. <laughs> Right. Um, so you might think it's it's doing OK, but uh, just because the immune like just because you're not getting a cold um, all the time or the flu or whatever, it doesn't mean that things aren't going on in the rest of your body like your uterus. Um, so you can still be developing things. I mean, I actually was just diagnosed with a fibroid uterus. Um, I didn't have any symptoms except that I'm gaining weight, um, but I'm also 55 and I think I'm trying to go through menopause. Um, not very well so far, but, <laughs> you know, so, and then I lost my husband last year. So there was a lot of emotional, um, gain, you know, weight gain there, kind of a, just a lot of things going on. So I had no idea um, that that was going on. Um, and, and that's, and that, you know, another thing where the emotions come into it. And with the uterus, that is really a center of, you know, feeling loved and connected. And so you've got to look at your relationships and, and things like that even. Um, so it was just very interesting. So I'm taking like 220 milligrams of iodine right now. Mm -hmm. oh, <laughs> um, because uh, it, it takes really high doses. Um, now, I don't recommend that people just, you know, start taking iodine. Um, you really should work with an iodine knowledgeable practitioner. Uh, because you do need uh, other nutrients like vitamin C, magnesium, the B vitamins, selenium, um, and things like that to help you process it without side effects. And you also need a lot of salt, um, unrefined sea salt. So that actually helps you detox the bromide. Wow. Well, we've got a lot of nodding heads over here, so I think you're saying things that people are truly agreeing with. I was I was looking over Dr. Yanni too because she's been nodding the whole time. Dr. Yanni, do you have any words on the tip of your tongue right now? Oh my gosh! Like, first of all, these two women are like right up my alley um, because I'm constantly speaking about these things in my office, and I'm I'm typically referring them to um, nutritionists. I'm typically referring people to naturopathic, you know, doctors because I just do see that people are really trying to segment their health care, right? They're like looking at their overall wellness and they're trying to figure out, oh, let me just attack this one problem. And it's so difficult when you're the first person, maybe the first provider they've ever seen in a, you know, quote unquote, Western setting who's saying you have a holistic issue. And um, when she talked about how, you know, like, you know, just the emotional center of the, the uterus, I'll tell you the ovaries are incredibly hormonally sensitive. You know, when I do my visceral mobilization techniques on the ovaries, I can't tell you there are countless times when women will have a full on emotional letdown. I mean, they could have the most toughest and the firmest personalities. And I tell you, you manip manipulate those, those ovaries, like all of a sudden, 
all of the all the walls that they've kept up, the hurt, the pain surrounding maybe some family problems surrounding the hurt and the guilt of you know dealing with infertility or the frustration of dealing with fibroids for so long. All of a sudden, they have uncontrollable tears and they're like, "Where's all this coming from?" And I'm like, "Well." You know, the ovaries are emotionally dense organ and I'm manipulating them and they're connecting with your endocrine system and there's parts of your limbic system which controls your emotions that is really connected to these organs and your body is is wants to let it out. Like it wants to express this frustration because this is what's required for us to heal. And I can't tell you that it might take a few sessions, but it's typically once we get past that emotional letdown that first visit or those, you know, first few times when it actually happens, it's like a huge turnaround in their overall outlook. It's like, finally, I have, I can trust my body to accept a seed. I can trust my body to heal. I, these scar, the scar tissue, these adhesions is not the end of me. My body can cyclically bleed every month and it doesn't have to be this, am I going to get my cycle this month? What's going to happen, you know? So and living in this fear. So I totally resonate with what they're saying because it's something that I preach firmly and something that I personally practice myself. You know, I'm, I'm the kind of provider that sees a chiropractor. I see my colleagues for public four therapy. I have a nutritionist, you know, I have, I do make sure that I have a well-rounded um, care team because I just don't want to leave anything up to chance. Absolutely. And, you know, there's women who, you know, for the women who may not uh, be able to have, you know, the, 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 the different levels of um, physicians and, and surgeons and uh, nutritionists, um, we want them to know this information so they, they know what to do when they're going to the grocery store, when they are going to see their, their primary care physician or their OBGYN, um, you know, making good choices when they're opening up the cabinet or the refrigerator. Um, all of this is just such valuable information for women um, to know and, and how they can navigate their diagnosis and navigate their health. This is great even if you don't have fibroids. You right. should know this information because we've got carcinogens just floating around out there and you need to know what's a trigger for all of these things. Um, right. so yes, absolutely. Absolutely. There was something I also wanted to mention that just came to mind as you were talking there is that also a lot of the evidence and the research that's out there right now is actually tested on Caucasian women. And so for a lot of black women, they don't have the context or the data to support what they truly feel. Um, I love that and that just shared, you know, the lactose intolerance. We don't have a lot of studies that tell us that, right? And so sometimes having a provider who is informed, who is either an ally or who looks like you, who gets it, who can break down that, yeah, I know the evidence says this, but for you, based off of your ethnicity, based off of your background, your age, this is the context this information sits in. I think it's a huge game changer. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And Chef Aki, I think it looks like you were about to say something. <laughs> I was just saying huge. I mean, I, I can't tell you how long I've been preaching this stuff. You know, uh, we were often raised to believe that uh, the, the, the most the delicacies of life in, in the culinary world are, you know, from France or from Europe. And as we all know, it's a lot of bread, cheese, wine, red meat, a lot of decayed, rotten food. And this is the highlight of the culinary world. OK. Let's just be honest here. And when it comes to the, what I would say, the indigenous biochemistry, this is not foods that work for us as tropical people. And we're talking about 600,000 hysterectomies are being performed. 78% of those are on black women. That's, that's insane. And so we have to take a moment and say, hold on, what are we doing that we weren't doing before in our tropical climate that we come from? What are we eating? There's something either in our environment, inside of us, in our minds and our spirits, something's gone awry. And we do absolutely have to look at that data and say, maybe this data had nothing to do with us. We may need to collaborate and build a health team of people who can advocate for us and understand the way our bodies work. Absolutely, I, I totally back you, sister, on that. Absolutely, and and for those of you watching, um, Chef Aki is, I'm a huge fan um, of everyone on this panel, but Chef Aki will be joining us in the cast of Red Alert, The Fight Against Fibroids. We're really thankful that she's gonna be sharing more of her information about how uh, diet affects us in our overall health and well-being. Um, and, and Chef Aki, many women with fibroids don't realize that a special diet is likely in order to help control their symptoms. So I want to talk about what foods are typically not good for diagnosed women or, you know, is there a superfood that's good for us too? 
I'm glad you asked. There are a few superfoods that, that women should eat and some things they should absolutely stay away from. Uh, I talk a lot about aroma taste based foods, staying away from this, you know, exogenous estrogen, making sure that we stay away from these excessive estrogens, whether it's BPA in plastic bottles, uh, just, you know, and like, like our sister Annette said, we can't stay away from everything. It's almost impossible. We're inundated swimming in this crap, right? But we, we do our best. So uh, staying away from red meat, staying away from, you know, I, I would say, honestly, if you're dealing with a serious uh, uh, issue, issue like tum tumors, <clears throat> to stay away from things even like legumes. Uh, I would stay away from dairy completely, get away from the red meats, you know, beef, chicken, even. Um, I mean, really just go on a serious cleanse because you want to starve out the fibroid, honestly, and you want to make sure that you... There's a, a link between fat and fibroids. I mean, we've just seen this over and over and over. And unfortunately, Black women are leading uh, the way in the U.S. when it comes to obesity. And there is a direct link. When we start to uh, uh, shrink the, the white adipose tissue, the fat, then we also start to see that fibroids shrink. And that data is consistent. So uh, at superfoods, I would say go for the sea moss, go for the chlorella, go for the moringa in the world of supplements, go for hemp seeds. I would say go for the blueberries, uh, go for the celery, go for the radish. Um, these are just some of the things. Uh, the, go for the dark lacinto kale, the dark leafy greens, the uh, callaloo and the dandelion greens. Uh, just some of the things that are first coming to mind for me. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. And we actually um, had to lose Dr. Yanni. She uh, had an appointment, of course. <laughs> so we, we definitely want to wish her well and all of that. And, and we're so thankful um, that she joined us on the panel discussion. Um, and I, I wanted to ask you too, uh, Chef Aki, about the fibroid elimination guide. Um, what can we expect to find? Um, what types of recipes or tips and, and how can people uh, grab that? Awesome. So just for you guys here at, at Red Alert, um, we're going to make it so that everybody who tunes in can get a free copy of this. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. <laughs> but, and, so if anybody, and I'll, I'll leave the link here. And if anybody's interested also in joining the next fibroid elimination program, then they can also join in as well. So we'll make sure that But what you get in the book is you're going to get a lot of great fibroid elimination recipes. It'll pretty much walk you through your own 90 day elimination where you'll follow a specific guide and you'll also eat on a schedule. So it teaches you how to eat according with your you know, circadian rhythms and all of that for proper digestion. So uh, and you'll get a lot of just kind of antidotes and, and you'll, you'll bust some myths. Also, some of those it's in my genes myths. No, it's on your plate. It's in your environment. It's in your mind. So some of those things you'll get as well. Awesome. And for those of you watching, um, we will see more of Chef Aki in just a little bit. She's going to bless us with a, a cooking demonstration. So we're excited about that. And um, Annette, I wanted to kind of close this out. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the five things your doctor isn't testing you for. What is that? <laughs> yeah, so um, that's my little freebie often if, um, if you want to get on my, my email list or whatever. Uh, so basically, some things that doctors don't really look at is nutrition, right? So iodine is one of those things. They're not testing for that. Um, I do hair tissue mineral analysis as well, and that's not a very common test. But um, really, the underlying root cause of everything is mineral dysregulation, vitamin A deficiency, and stress. And so we need to be looking at those things. Um, and so there's, I think in my five things, it was uh, like your genes. So knowing your genes can be very helpful uh, to know, like for, for example, genetically, some people cannot convert beta carotene to vitamin A. Uh, so knowing that is very helpful because you're, um, you're gonna know if a vegan diet is the right diet for you. And so th the one thing that um, I think everybody needs to know is you need to pay attention to your body and make sure that you're eating the foods that are serving your body, um, not that are serving everyone else's body because we're all different and there is no one size fits all. Um, so that's one, one helpful thing with genetics is it can kind of help us know what nutrients we can process well and what, which ones we can't. Um, and then the iodine, the hair tissue to find kind of your mineral balance 
And what else is in there? <laughs> it's been a while since I wrote it. Lots of goodies. <laughs> oh, salt, yeah. So salt um, is also really important. And of course, we're told not to eat salt. Yeah. Um, you know, and we actually need it. And actually, a low salt diet acts as a contraceptive. So if you are trying to get pregnant, you you don't want to do a low salt diet. <laughs> wow. Wow. So, I'm going I'm to run to the kitchen real quick. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> I love salt. Salt is good. I tell people that all the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, ladies, thank you so much for blessing us on this panel. Um, I know that I've learned quite a bit, and I'm sure our viewers have learned quite a bit as well. You are both beautiful inside and out. And um, I really want people to stay connected with the both of you to learn more about how we can heal ourselves through knowledge and food, our mind, body, and soul all together. So thank you so much for joining us on uh, Red, Red Alert, a conversation about her health. And uh, we look forward to seeing more from you. Well, I hope you guys are as enlightened as I was. But first, did you know? no control um it's like you know you're taking naproxen and you're taking you know, these pain medications you're you know doing everything you can to kind of do what you've been doing again for half more than half of your life and it seems like it's progressively getting worse and you don't really know where you kind of stand of like what you can do i, I felt i kind of blamed myself i thought maybe I'm not, you know, changing enough. I'm not getting myself together enough. You know, I need to stay tight and just buy, you know, five, six boxes at a time and just get myself together. So that was exclusive footage from Red Alert to Fight Against Fibroids. That was Anne Marie. Um, she was a delightful interview, and I'm sure that the story that she tells and that she has just told you, uh, many women can relate to that. Oh my gosh, you guys, this has been such an exciting and amazing experience. And now we're down to our final segment, a cooking demonstration with celebrity vegan chef, Chef Aki, who will be joining us in making a Thai mango salad. I'm so excited about this salad, y'all. Look at all the colors and look how, oh my gosh, it looks so good. So without further ado, go Chef Aki. Hey, Chef Aki. Hey there, how are you? I'm great. You've been a wealth of information throughout this entire experience. You gave us so much knowledge in the health and wellness panel. And so now I'm really excited that you're going to be cooking for us. What are you making today? Oh, I'm excited too. Thank you. I'm making today one of my favorite recipes from the Fiber Elimination Recipe Guide. This is our Thai mango basil salad. This is a salad that could be room temperature, cold, or warm. Either way, it's delicious. I'm so excited to present it to you today. So guys, follow along. If you've got the recipe, feel free to join me in preparing this quick and easy dish. This dish is wonderful for anybody who's looking to saturate their palate with the sweet, savory, zesty, spicy, it's got everything that you're looking for. This is a wonderful way to get that beautiful mouthfeel without all the heavy starch, meat, dairy, grease, you name it. So very, very simple. What we need first are some fresh ingredients. I wanna walk you through some of these ingredients that we have here today. So as you can see here, we've got some beautiful, colorful peppers. We've got the yellow, orange, red peppers. We've got some Roma tomatoes. I really love grape or cherry tomatoes. This is what I could find here in Belize. We've got some limes here, some red onion, or you could use green onion. As you can see, we've got some beautiful scallions here. I get these fresh from my farmer, Roberto. He brings these from the garden. We've got some purple cabbage. We've got zucchini. We also have cucumber, some cilantro, and of course our mango, which is the star. But we have to have our noodle base, so you can do it a few ways. We've got some buckwheat noodles here. 
And these are wonderful for all my gluten-free sisters who are cleaning up their diets. We've also got zucchini here. If you wanna shred these up and make a nice raw noodle, you can stick it right into one of these little noodle, noodle pillars here and have a nice uh, raw noodle base as well. So it's up to you. So today I'm gonna stick with my buckwheat noodle. We're gonna just dump that into some hot water and just give that about five minutes to get nice and soft. And while it's cooking, we're gonna jump right over here and start to make our topping. So the topping for this beautiful salad, as you can see here, we're gonna start with some fresh ingredients. So the first thing we wanna do is start with our mango. So there's a million ways to cut a mango. But one of my favorite things to do is I like to go down about five different areas of the mango and meet at a point here. And I'll show you how you can just peel the whole mango and get all the flesh right out of this baby. It's so easy to do it this way. Y'all ready? And just take the flesh right off like this. And you just peel it like you're just taking a jacket off this thing. Very, very easy to get to. There's a million ways to do this, right? This is a really nice one. All right. This is gonna give us that nice sweetness that we're looking for. Now, if you don't care for mango, you could use pineapple. You could even use like mandarin oranges will be delicious in this salad. It's up to you. All right. So let's get right on into this mango. It's got a huge seed in it. A lot of good flesh on it too. Beautiful. So we just want to cut this into like little slivers. You don't want to necessarily dice it because we want to kind of keep it consistent with our noodles. Perfect. And I'm going to toss this right into our little bowl here. And we're just going to start to build our salad. Beautiful. Now I get these right only one time a year. We keep these for maybe two months and then it's just over. I'm gonna taste one. Oh, it's so good. All right, so let's start to add our peppers. Add some color up in here. So I don't care for the flavor of green peppers. You wanna keep the nice light flavored sweet flavored uh, peppers for this. So you really want sweet peppers. Go for the orange, go for the red, and the yellow. All right. And we're going to do the same thing we did with our mango and just give it a nice Julian style chop. Now, I want to make sure you guys can see me. So I'm going to get a little closer to you if that's okay. There we go. All right. Perfect. Now, like I said, you could do red onion. I love red onion. It's a little strong for some people, but super good for you. Good for the blood, good for the brain. So I always like to add a little bit of red onion to the salad. Okay. Perfect. Now to that, let's go ahead and add our purple cabbage. 
give it even more color. And we really want to make this a nice, fine, we don't want to be crunching too hard into the salad. We want to give it a nice, fine, julienne shredded cabbage. You can even use your food processor for some of this stuff. Or you can use just like a, a shredder or peeler. But I really like to do this by hand. Beautiful. A little bit more of that. Nice. To that, let's go ahead and add in some cucumber and basil. This is just going to add to the freshness. And you are welcome to leave the skin on your cucumber, but I'm going to take mine off. Looks like our noodles are doing great over here. And keeping in with our theme, I'm going to keep all these seeds in here because I just love the juiciness and the texture personally, but you don't have to. Keeping in with our theme, just give this a nice Julian style cut. This is what's considered a stack chop, guys, with a little chef school real quick. <laughs> I know a lot of people are intimidated to make some of these dishes because of their chopping skills. And I would certainly suggest that any woman that's looking to take on a new lifestyle, a healthy lifestyle, should certainly get her chopping skills up because it's going to really, really help you. And it takes just a little time to get used to it. It just takes repetition, honestly. Just a little repetition. But once you get the hang of it, you'll be smooth flowing. All right. We've got some cucumbers in there. Okay, and from there, let's go ahead and add in some green onion and basil. Let's go to our basil next. And once we toss up our noodles, imagine all of the flavors and the textures. We're going to toss this up with a little bit of sesame seed oil. I'm going to add in a little bit of coconut aminos. This is very important for anybody taking on a new lifestyle who wants to get that savory, sweet flavor from foods. And you don't want to use soy sauce because you're staying away from estrogenic foods, right? Using coconut aminos is a game changer. You want to use things like dulse, a seaweed seasoning, which we'll use today, as well as coconut aminos. And that's going to give you that soy sauce flavor that you've been looking for. Right. I'm going to do a little bit more basil because I love basil. This is Thai basil, you all. You can use regular green basil. That's just fine. But I really love the flavor of Thai basil. It just makes it more traditional. This would be delicious even with uh, papaya, ripe or unripe papaya. Nice. All right. We're getting there. We're getting there. Let's get this green onion going. I love scallions. They bring so much flavor. So we're going to use the base as well as the, um, the green parts of our scallion. We want all the flavors. delicious also with garlic chives. When you're on this diet, ladies, you are not eating garlic. So really important to still get that flavor. Scallions, garlic chives are acceptable and really give good flavor. You're going to want it. Going on over here. Looking good. 
I'm going to throw these in a little cold bath before we add them to our dish. And while they're taking a bath, we're going to start seasoning up our salad over here. Okay, perfect. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with using seaweed as seasoning, but there's so many ways to do it. Using wakame is a really wonderful way to add iodine um, and just to add more nutrient dense um, foods to your diet. You can put this in cold water and it will pretty much um, fluff it up and soften up very quickly. You can put it in soups, you can put it in salads, you can put it in stew, and it just fluffs right up and it kind of takes on the flavor of almost everything you put it with. It does have a slight fishiness, which is great for this dish, but maybe not for everything, but it's a wonderful thing just to add to your diet to just make it more mineral dense. And of course, we've got some pink Himalayan sea salt, which we'll add. We also have some black sesame seed as well, which we will add to this as well. So I've got my trusty little citrus squeezer for my limes. And we're going to start to add in some flavors. Oops, I almost got my, forgot my tomatoes. Can't forget those. I'm going to also leave in all the seeds of my tomatoes. I'm going to cut these into, you can cut them into fours, but we'll break it down a little more. Make it just a little more bite size. Since I really prefer cherry tomatoes, they're very rare here. And this just makes for like a super juicy, flavorful salad. Let's add one more of those. Turn my fire off over here. All right. So now we're going to remove our noodles, give them a little bath so they can cool off. I've got some already blended ginger that I'm going to add. This is optional. You do not have to use ginger if you can't really take it. But I'll tell you, ladies, when you're fighting reproductive issues, adding ginger, adding cayenne, adding citrus like grapefruit, lemons, limes, it's one of the best things you can do every day if nothing else. Ginger tea, putting ginger and cayenne into just about everything. So this is a perfect recipe for fighting fibroids. And these gluten-free noodles are just perfect. All right, so our noodles are taking a bath, and we're going to start to throw in some flavor. All right. So I've got my seaweed seasoning dulse over here. Dulse is really just nori. If you're not familiar with nori, it's what you use to make um, sushi. So it's pretty popular and it gives a nice fishy flavor. So we're going to throw a little bit. I blended up my own nori since they don't sell dulls here in Belize. And I'm just going to sprinkle that on the dish just to give us that same kind of fishy flavor that we would get from like a fish sauce. Just going to sprinkle that on the dish. We're going to throw in a little bit of sesame seed oil. Just a little. We don't want it to overpower the dish. Sesame seed is very strong, as you know. We're going to throw in a little bit of black sesame seed. Hit it with some sea salt. A lot of salt, as we learned today. Salt is good. If you use the right kind of salt, the body needs salt. Salt is electric. All right. 
I'm gonna throw in a pinch of agave. Don't need much of that. Definitely wanna upgrade our sweetener as we are moving into a healthier lifestyle. And let's toss in a whole lime. Beautiful, this is smelling so good, you guys. Nice. Okay. And then lastly, I'm going to go ahead and put in some cilantro. I love cilantro. This is optional. Let's do a little bit more of that. I love cilantro. I know some people just cannot tolerate it, but I love it. Right. We've got cilantro. To that, I'm going to throw in some pre blended ginger. And let's give that a nice stir and get all those flavors mixed up in there before we add our noodles. You guys, this smells so good. I'm gonna throw a little bit of cayenne pepper in there just to spice it up. But this is smelling so right right now. Mm, mm, mm. Okay. And it's time to add our noodles. And I just like to chill this. You can chill this overnight and serve it for a picnic. You can serve this for, you can take it to just about like a barbecue. I mean, because you can chill it and it tastes delicious, chill or room temperature. So it's one of those dishes that you really just, you can't mess this up. Beautiful. All right, let's mix this up. OMG. Y'all, this smells so good. <laughs> this smells so good. All right. Now, how I would typically serve it may just be on a bib lettuce or a bed of kale or anything like that would work. Gorgeous. Add a little bit of onion to it. Just to top it off and make it look pretty, you can put a little bit of your um, sesame seed on top of it. Just to make it look pretty. And you can serve. Gorgeous. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Get into it. I hope you guys love this super quick and easy recipe. I'm going to dig a fork in this. I, I personally cannot wait. Oh my God, this is so good. This is so good. I hope you guys enjoy this dish. Make it for your family. Tell me how much you love it. And again, you guys will get this recipe. Oh my goodness, I am jealous, jealous, jealous. That looks so good. Oh my gosh. You know, when I hear you talk um, in other places like your TEDx, you talk about your grandmother and the garden that your grandmother had. It's the spirit of your grandmother in that bowl, girl. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. My grandmother grew almost everything we ate. So, I mean, if it's not colorful, fresh ingredients from her garden, my grandmother's 89, just turned 90 actually this year, wow. and she's still kicking, going strong, and I know it's because of her lifestyle. Oh, I love it, I love it. Thank you so much. That was such an amazing cooking demonstration. Thank, Thank you. you for blessing us. You're a, a wonderful chef. Um, we look forward to hearing more from you, Chef Aki. And uh, stay well, be well, and be blessed.
Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. See you guys. Oh my goodness, you guys, we are just about bringing this experience to a close and I just could not be more grateful or more thankful for everything that we've experienced. Um, I'd, I'd like to turn this over to a very special moment for me. Um, I want to show you guys the trailer of Red Alert, the Fight Against Fibroids documentary. I've been working on it for three and a half years now. Um, we are still filming. And uh, this is the two minute trailer that we put out earlier this year. This gives you a glimpse of what to look for and what's to come. I hope you enjoy and I'll see you right after it's over. Fibroid is a tumor of the wall of the uterus, by far the most common benign tumor uh, in the reproductive age women. I come uh, concerned about uterine fibroid research. Of the $27 billion that you have in your budget, only $5 million is being spent on uterine fibroid research. He said the pain that you're experiencing, they're contractions. They're called contractions. Your body thinks you're getting ready to give birth. They did a vaginal sonogram and were able to tell that the fibroid was growing and I was prescribed Vicodin during my first um, pregnancy for the pain. There was no concern at all, you know, taking the medication and what that would do to my child. These tumors are much more common in the United States because we have a, um, a larger black population and fibroids are more common among black women. At least three or four times more common. And they are discovered like at least 10 years earlier in black women. For me, I believe that God led me here. It wasn't by choice. I didn't think I'd be treating women with fibroids. I'm not having a great day. But if you scream, you feel like you're whining. Just I'm angry and I'm tired. Why is it when we're in the doctor's office, we're only offered invasive treatments? Why is it we're not talking about this when we're in middle school, high school, college? Why is this not a topic of discussion? If so many women are suffering from it, why aren't we talking about it? I feel emotional every time I watch that trailer. Um, it's my life. It's the life of so many women out there who struggle with uterine fibroids, and I hope that it will serve them all well. We're still raising donations toward our film finishing fund. Be a part of our crew by pledging your donation. Your donation is not just for a film. You are investing in the lives of millions of women diagnosed and yet to be diagnosed with uterine fibroid tumors. A special thank you to our sponsor, the American Heart Association, and our fiscal sponsor, the Her Next Chapter Organization for Women. I am truly thankful for our sister alignment. Go to redalertmovie.com or hernextchapter.org, become a member of Her Next Chapter, but go there to donate to the documentary and your donation is tax deductible. Remember, Red Alert is more than a documentary. It's an understanding that we can take charge of our own health and wellness. Thank you all for attending Red Alert, a conversation about her health. Be blessed.